Uh, yes, we've got the stuff to do it, but I'm gonna be frank, I'm not as good at welding aluminum and I really want the radiator to not be a disaster. A little frustrating because I'd like to be further along, but obviously this is a super cool car and just an awesome profile. <laughs> KW makes the perfect suspension for every demand. Find them in the description below. What's up people? So back with the Formula One hot rod. Now today we have got the body panels in their stock form uh, held up on the car. Now as you can see there is a nice jack right here gently holding the under tray up against the bottom of the car. And then we have the engine cover and side pods here uh, non-modified just in place. And where we're at now is there's got to be some specific fitment panels made and things that are precise. But we really can't do that yet until the under tray is firmly affixed and can't possibly move. So right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this apart and then we're gonna start fabricating whatever tabs and things we do to make sure the under tray is affixed, that then we can put it back together and start worrying about all the pods. The other thing about that is with the under tray, and that's the flat bottom, a little bit of a venturi effect going on. Uh, that's also very important because in the side pods there has to be the uh, water air uh, radiator and also the oil cooler which is effectively also a radiator but we call them oil coolers so those will need to go in there and there also has to be some support because it creates a venturi and sucks itself down so that'll be a triangulated affair that comes out to the outer part of it and then comes up to the monocoque or the space frame created in the rear so let's time lapse this thing and just have some fun <laughs> Okay guys, so now that we have the panels off and the under tray up on, uh, we're able to take a look with regard to the water radiator here and the oil cooling other side, which you guys saw. Those came out of the radical that was dismantled to take all the expensive bits out and build a cooler car out of it. Just leaving the Hulk of what's left of the old car, which I think will be a good genus garage project in the future with what's left there. But anyway, uh, one, I wanna say thank you to Blaine, who you guys can see is helping me. Actually, I'm paying him to help me on this project um, because we're at a bit of a chill place with him doing the Genius Garage stuff and he's really diligent and helpful, so I appreciate him there. But anyway, I just wanna show you guys what we got. So, we got a radiator and the oil cooler are literally like the perfect sizes um, to fit in these side pods to channel air with the, you know, the nature of these original side pods that came from Indy. Uh, that we're modifying. And naturally, the radiator and the oil cooler over here are properly matched for this engine because they ran with this engine in a racing configuration. So that was one of the reasons with buying an old race car and dismantle because we know all those things work together and then you save a lot of time and money with regard to research and development basically and testing when you build something custom like this. So keep that in mind when you guys are building something. Sometimes it's better to take something that already works and then reconfigure it rather than start from scratch. Actually, I take that back. It's always better to do that. But anyway, so let's look at the uh, oil cooler and why we ended up choosing the left side. So a couple of things going on here. This is the dry sump tank out of the IndyCar. Now it's a bit larger than what was necessary for Radical or the motorcycle engine, but we'd always put a little less oil in it or just run more oil, higher capacity. Now this 
dry sump tank goes inside the monocoque. So we will put that back in and we know it works. So we're just going to clean it out, clean it up and it's going to be great. You've got your return line up here. You got a vent, you got another type of vent and overflow. And then here you've got the place on the bottom of the sump tank where it sucks your um, unaerated oil that's been in there. So this goes inside there. Now we're limited to these positions. So your return line is up here. This is where the oil has got to go into the sump tank and then it will come out down here. Now a couple things to be mindful of with regard to oil lines. You got a bunch of headers right here and they're going to get hot. So if you had a problem with your oil lines, that's where you're going to have a fire. So if possible, you want to avoid running oil and fuel lines anywhere near your exhaust system. And in this circumstance, if we walk over to the other side of the car again, now Blaine was real nice to look this up. He found the parts manual to a radical on how it was plumbed with regard to the dry sump system in it, which was good quick reference for us. Right here, we've got one line coming off the dry sump uh, system. And down here, there's another fitting. I don't know if you can see, but it's a bit bigger down here at the bottom. It's got that red cap on it, so it's not leaking everywhere. And also, Blaine, we've got another fitting right here, which what's this all about? Was that for a mechanical gauge or a sender? Okay, well, let's figure that out. Anyway, so we learned that this is where the oil comes out of the sump tank, the uh, pressure going out. So this is where it has to return up to here to the sump tank. And the one at the bottom is where your unaerated oil from the bottom of the sump tank will go in. So now this line here actually goes to the left side of the motor because the actual pump for the sump system dry sump system is here on the side of the motor and then it has a special pan at the bottom. So that's actually the pump and the fitting down here is the one that comes out. So what we'll actually do is we'll loosen it and turn it. So it comes out this way to from the left side and it'll travel upwards along the side of the motor here and up to the return real nice. And there'll be very little area where it's remotely close to the header. So it'll be nicely packaged and go right up in there. Now the other side, it would be better if it was on this side, but it's not. And that's not reasonable to change. So what we'll probably do is run a line, a end line off that with a 90 degree. And instead of going the theoretical shorter distance here, which will go right by the headers, we're actually going to do a 90 degree. We're going to go around the back side of the motor where there's a lot of room space and it's nice and cool. And we'll, and then it can just make a real nice gradual sweeping bend and then do a straight shot right to the bottom of the sump tank here. So we avoid going around the headers. We're not adding very much length and you're avoiding sharp bends uh, with the exception of the 190, but the other way you'd have to potentially do two. So uh, we're making the direction of the oil simpler, which is funny because in a manner of speaking, your oil system in a race car kind of has to be like how you drive a race car. You want the least amount of sharp bends possible and the shortest straight distance to get to where you need to go to be efficient. So the other thing now I forgot to mention is we have our oil cooler here. So to keep things from getting too hot, we need to plumb that in somewhere. So uh, the thinking right now is the engine has an oil filter on it. So it does its own filtering going on in there, which presumably happens immediately following the oils going into the sump tank it goes where it gets pressurized. It goes through that before it goes to the motor. So what we're going to do is because of the size of this oil line here, when it, the oil comes out of the sump pump here at the dry sump pump. It's going to make a straight shot here to the bottom of the oil cooler, which is really easy. And then obviously it does its thing, cools, comes up here, it'll come out and then it'll go into the return line here, which is actually pretty neat because it makes a little bit of a deviation come over here to the oil cooler. And in doing so at the exact right spot, it deviates from getting anywhere close to the headers. So we're killing two birds with one stone and it's very nice that we're able to, um, I don't want to say engineer it like that, but that we can configure it like that in an intelligent manner. So I'm very excited about that. And then obviously we'll have to direct this with the proper mounting and shrouding so it can flex and be hot and also seal for the air coming in the side pod before it then goes out. The other thing that's nice is we're going to leave this open at the top. So it's a bit of an air intake to the engine. Not only will it provide some cool air to the engine bay, up at the top, but it'll also allow the cool air up here where your intakes are going to be. We're just going to run uh, some K and N type cone filters, which are on their way. They'll go right to the carb. It's going to sound really great, make it really simple uh, to work. So I, th I think everything's going really well. You'll have your oil fill here. You'll have your fuel fill right here. And then this little guy here is for the air shocks, which uh, will be the original from the Indy car and should still work. So that's pretty neat, which reminds me, Blaine, we're going to have to cut a hole in the under tray back here when we relocate it. Not that big a deal. Not that big a deal. 
But anyways, that's what's going on guys. So we got to start engineering that and we have yet to affix the under tray. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to be putting on a couple of gussets down here with regard to where the frame attaches at the bottom. I was going to do that anyway. So we're going to make the gusset a little bit bigger and use that actually as an attachment point for the under tray. And then in the back, we will attach it to the vertical wall of the, um, the under tray because it will be stronger to where it would want to suck effectively. And then it's going to be a little trickier when we get up here going to the aluminum part of the monocoque and carbon carbon and carbon aluminum. We've got to be a little nicer. You don't want to crush things in honeycomb. All right, you guys finished up for today on the F1 hot rod build. Uh, I want to show you a few things here. So the under tray is in place. I uh, did my best to show you guys a time lapse, see what's going on. Currently we're working on some supports. You can see one right here that will be a triangulative support, get the outside of the uh, under tray here. It's all made of carbon fiber, creates the venturis. Uh, there you can see the oil cooler and that's where it's gonna end up living. I showed you guys how that all routes out, of course. And currently the radiator is at a uh, welding shop. They're frankly better at welding aluminum than I. Uh, yes, we've got the stuff to do it, but I'm gonna be frank, I'm not as good at welding aluminum and I really want the radiator to not be a disaster and I don't need to hate my life anymore, so I will pay somebody to do it better than I. And admit when I'm not good at something. Someday, maybe. But anyway, that's what's going on. Uh, a little frustrating because I'd like to be further along, but obviously this is a super cool car and just an awesome profile. One crazy thing that I noticed, I wanna show you guys just the wildness of this car. So you see the lower A arm here, right? And it goes in the tub and mounts to something. And the one over there goes inside the tub as well. And it just goes right in there. Now, something about that is when the car's wrecked back in the super speedways and got hit in, the A arms could go in the cockpit. So, on later cars, just as a note, and this is the Genius Garage one over here, you can see that there's an anti intrusion bar built on these that's supposed to help the A arm from not going into the car. Uh, but what's crazy about this design that I think is just amazing, it goes to show the engineering and how tight it all is. First of all, the shocks are on the inside. So, there is a bell crank pushed by the push rod and then goes all the way over and then pushes the shock back down that way and your feet go underneath that. So this is your hole for your feet. And I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this, but right here with my hand, this is the brake pedal, right? And then the gas pedal's over here and the clutch pedal's over here. But, and you're not gonna be able to see it, I swear to you guys, the A-arm mounts to the same bulkhead that the pedals are mounted to. Literally the A-arm is mounting to almost exactly where the well, not exactly, like right next to where the pedals pivot from. Isn't that wild? I mean, how tight of engineering is that? So really kind of cool, exciting. Obviously it's gonna be all right. They, engineer, they knew what they were doing back then. And of course, IndyCar racing, Formula One car racing, especially in the early 90s, had an element of danger as it does today, but it's still a really well engineered car. And I just wanted to tell you guys that because I think it's cool how tightly engineered it is, much like a fighter jet. And I'm pretty happy with the nature of how the space frame is here. It fits very well, as I originally measured it to be, into with the Venturi tunnels going on either side and the support. So I'm really pleased about that and the packaging and what it's gonna be like. And the other thing that's fantastic about this is when you start looking at the size of the side pods and all, got a lot of room to work on it and see everything and clean it up. So it's packaged nicely. You can see the header over here where it comes out. I cut that off because we're gonna have to have it come up a little bit more and out and then go out there through the A arms and above the half shaft or drive shaft as you put it. So. That's where it's at, guys. I hope you enjoyed seeing that and coming along today, just doing a bit of work on it, but that's, that's what a day in the life is like, building a crazy custom car like that. Uh, and then got lots more to come, clearly. But uh, really hitting this hard, wanna get it finished um, and out, got a lot more things coming up. I gotta obviously fix my broken ass hoopties, <laughs> like Hoovy or whatever else. But that's the fun, isn't it? You build your dreams, you work your way up, because we all enjoy cars. So I really appreciate you guys being here. Please subscribe. Of course, come back next time. I enjoy having you and comment below. See you guys next time. Well, a huge thank you to Crush Proof Tubing Company. Since 1949 in Macomb, Ohio, they've been manufacturing custom rubber and plastic tubes for every industry imaginable. No tooling or mold costs, fast and free custom samples, and American-made quality is what sets them apart. But for me, I'm most excited about their exhaust evacuation kit. Different modular pieces and their convoluted custom hoses make it so that I can adapt any car, truck, or motorcycle with an internal combustion engine to get those exhaust gases out of my shop so I can keep working in safety and comfort. 
But beyond just that, they build a variety of hoses for a custom OEM world. You'll see stretchable drain tubing and bellows, as well as agriculture, medical, and military. So again, guys, Crush Proof Tubing Company, crushproof.com, and go down in the description below to see where to get your free samples for industry or your exhaust tubing.